Um, you see our topic. Uh, I have mixed views about it, and you're, you're going to hear those mixed views in a moment. But in 2008, I was involved behind the scenes in a major debate in Australia on this question. It was uh, live to 1,200 people, but it was uh, broadcast on our ABC, the national uh, broadcaster. So the stakes were high. Uh, the exact motion was we'd be better off without religion. There were three professors arguing for it, three against it. I was against the motion, in, the, in case that's not clear. <laughs> and the main religion under discussion was, for sure, Christianity. Uh, what they did is they took an entrance poll of the 1,200 or so people to see what they thought before the debate, and then an exit poll to see if we had, you know, convinced everyone of the truth. Uh, I am sad to say we lost this debate overwhelmingly, both the entrance and the exit poll. Overwhelmingly, this group of 1,200 Australians thought we would indeed be better off without the Christian faith. And I came away that night with clarity about a, a feeling that had been emerging for some years. It used to be common to hear people criticize Christianity for being too holy, holier than thou, too good, too moralistic. Now it is just as common, at least where I come from, to have people say, no, no, the problem with Christianity is that it is pernicious and violent and bigoted. It is bad. And there's increasing data to suggest that a lot of people in a lot of countries think just this. Six out of ten Australians agreed with the Ipsos poll asking, you know, does religion do more harm in the world than good? Six out of ten Australians. Uh, Australians came in number two in the world. Uh, that is the second worst view of religion, if that's something to be proud of. America, though, four in ten. That's a lot of humans think that Christianity has damaged the world. Um, my instinct used to be to defend Christianity at every turn. But the more I've thought about this, especially since that very public loss, the more convinced I am that actually the first response, for me as a believer, is to concede the problem. To concede that Christianity has indeed done great damage in the world. That the church has done terrible things in the world. After all, uh, this should be second nature for Christians because Christians don't believe the kind of secular motto that we're good through and through and mostly getting better. This is not the Christian view. Christians, uh, some think depressingly, I think liberatingly, think that we're, we're mostly rotten. And, and it's, it's in Jesus' Sermon on the Mount where he taught the most lofty ethic of love and honesty and purity and all that. But the opening line of the Sermon on the Mount was, blessed are the poor in spirit. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. The opening line of the most lofty ethic ever uttered is actually that the, the truly blessed one is the one who acknowledges that bankrupt, morally, spiritually bankrupt. And then Jesus goes on to teach all sorts of fantastic things for which we're very grateful. They've had a massive influence on our world. But as Jesus begins to land the plane, as it were, in the Sermon on the Mount, a couple of chapters later, he makes an extraordinary remark to his disciples not to think that because they're in possession of all this glorious teaching, that makes them good. This famous statement of Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount, why do you look at the speck in your neighbor's eye, but do not notice the log in your own eye? Or how can you say to your neighbor, let me take the speck out of your eye while the log is in your eye? You hypocrite. 
First take the log out of your own eye, then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your neighbor's eye. Said to his own followers to remind them that being in possession of this lofty ethic is no guarantee they're not going to have a whopping great big log in their own eye. So, so for me, this is the theological justification for what is now my first instinct whenever I hear of Christian wrongdoing, to admit it, concede it, and often to just say I'm really sorry. And beyond that, there is just the historical data. This is the problem with being a historian. I know where the bodies are buried in the churchyard. <laughs> There's a lot of them. And so the, just the pure historical evidence of otherwise sincere Christians behaving badly is overwhelming. I, I think of the mob riots in Alexandria at the end of the 4th century, beginning of the 5th century, when Christians could begin to sniff the reins of power that ended up murdering the greatest philosopher of Alexandria, Hypatia. And we know it was Christians who did it. We know the ringleader. His name was Peter. His job was to read the Bible in church each Sunday. And he murdered this great pagan woman who was an elite philosopher. Or I think of a few centuries later, uh, Charlemagne and Charles the Great, who uh, in the 1870s um, was... Um, Brutal in his treatment of the Saxons, those scary northern Europeans. Uh, he couldn't convert them. And so he conducted what many historians have called a jihad, where he offered the Saxons baptism or the sword. You choose. I'm a fair fellow. Brutalized them into conversion. And I have stood on the spot of one of the worst moments in Christian history, July 15, 1099. Jerusalem, home of three great religions, the so-called city of peace. In the blistering heat of July 15, 1099, 10,000 European crusaders broke through Jerusalem's walls and fought their way up here to one of Islam's most sacred sites and committed one of the great atrocities of Christian history. Thousands barricaded themselves in up here and sought refuge in the mosque. Some even climbed the roof of the mosque to escape. But the crusaders burst through and slaughtered men, women and children. Some they threw off the high walls to their deaths. The rest they butchered. The carnage apparently filled this great promenade. When the fighting was done, the pilgrims, as they like to call themselves, marched 500 meters that way to the ancient Church of the Holy Sepulchre, where they held a thanksgiving service. The irony is scorching. Near this church a millennium earlier, Jesus of Nazareth had died on a Roman cross having called his followers to love their enemies. I hardly know what to say. I still hardly know what to say. And what made that scene all the more difficult to film is that our Muslim guide, uh, uh, given to us by the mosque to look after us for the day to make sure everything went well, was just uh, one foot to the side of camera as I delivered those lines. And she is a Jerusalem Muslim. And Yes, she is. Her name is Esrae. And as I uh, repeated my lines, because I'm not a one-take wonder in front of the camera, I'm afraid to say, I uh, said it three or four times, I could see just to the side of camera she had a tear in her eye. Now, I know full well we can say all sorts of interesting things about the Crusades. You might want to ask me about that. But here's the thing that struck me. Christian bad behavior can leave a 900-year-old scar. I found myself, in fact, saying, 
I am so sorry. I am so sorry. Now, I know it's ridiculous. I wasn't there. I like to think I wouldn't have done it. And yet, in that moment, it felt like the right thing to say. And there may be people here tonight, even in a location like Wheaton College, who have been damaged by Christian bad behaviour. And I honestly think every genuine Christian in the building would love to say to you, we are sorry that the church has done so much harm. Some contemporary researchers uh, have begun to argue that this is endemic in uh, religion, that religion produces a kind of punitive mentality. Uh, you, you may know that um, in 2015, the very prestigious psychology department of the University of Chicago, I'm pointing that way, but I think it's that way, right? <laughs> Chicago. Um, published a study where they found that the children of religious parents are on the whole less generous and more punitive than children raised in entirely secular environments. They repeated the study five times and then published this very important paper in Current Biology, a prestigious journal article. When the Daily Beast uh, got hold of uh, this research, uh, they published a very cool headline, Study Finds Religious Kids Are Jerks. Um, <laughs> Uh, this, this was really big news in 2015, 2016. Uh, it was reported uh, in our newspapers in, in Australia. Um, and I think we can concede. Those of you who believe this stuff, I'm sure you can see how Christianity can actually uh, foster a punitive mentality to little ones. You so want to inculcate in them right, wrong, you know, good, bad that actually children grow up with this, I'm good, you're bad, mentality. That's what these psychologists were suggesting. And for the year or so after this study came out, I did my thing around the country, saying Christians need to concede that we can raise punitive children who are self-righteous and so on. I, I did, I took my own advice and conceded the problem. And then I, someone in a question time, question times are always exciting, um, often for the audience, sometimes not for the speaker, someone put up their hand in, in one of my lectures and said, hasn't that study been questioned? And I hadn't heard that, I just sort of mumbled something uh, and went away from there and looked it up and sure enough, people had begun to question this famous study from the psychology department of the University of Chicago. And it turns out it had to go back to review. And when all the data was opened up, it turned out the data was junk and the interpretation was junk. And now if you go to the current biology website and try and look at this article, it has a big retracted right across it. The whole thing was false from top to bottom. Why am I telling you that? Because as much as I think uh, Christians ought to concede the bad behavior of Christians, we all, whether we are believers or not, need to be aware that exaggerations creep into this discussion. And we need to be able to avoid exaggerating the bad behavior. Concede, yes, but avoid the exaggerations because um, retellings of Christian bad behavior often have the character of a, a new generation bad-mouthing the previous generation to make the new generation look good. This has happened all the way through human history, and it requires exaggeration, because that's how we look better. People will do it to us in 100 years, for sure. Let me give you just a few examples that, that come to mind about uh, the, the exaggerations one hears on the topic of Christian bad behavior. I, I mentioned the murder of Hypatia, in 415. The question though is, was the murder of Hypatia part of a broader trend in Christianity to oppose women and stifle education? Which is how the story is often told. Uh, there's a very famous book called The Darkening Age by Catherine Nixie, 
where she makes this very point. This is emblematic of what Christians do. They, they harm women and they stifle education, so they murdered the great philosopher Hypatia. The problem with this as history is that we only know about this event because Christian sources recorded it to condemn it. And those same sources praise Hypatia. Christian sources praise Hypatia, though she wasn't a Christian, as the most learned person in Egypt at the time. What's more, we now know that Hypatia had many Christian students, several of whom went on to become the bishops of Egypt and North Africa. They loved her. So as despicable as the murder of Hypatia was, it, it, it is clearly wrong to exaggerate it to become like a parable of what Christianity always does. Or I mentioned Charlemagne's awful policy of baptism or the sword. But the question is, is this typical? It's easy for me to tell the story and leave the impression that that's basically how Christianity spread for a thousand years. But what is less well known is that the great Alcuin of York, the most learned man in Europe at the time, so he was called, was one of Charlemagne's courtiers. And we now have two letters that he wrote to the court where Alcuin begged in the name of Christ for Charlemagne to stop the brutality. And he reminded the great Charlemagne that actually the only way to see people truly converted was just like the apostles, through sweet, gentle persuasion. And miraculously, for any of you who know about Charlemagne, he changed his mind. And in 797, completely changed the policy toward the pagan lands. Perhaps the most uh, striking and popular of the exaggerations has to do with the Spanish Inquisition. Now, I know some of you can't even hear those words without thinking of a particular British skit about no one expecting the Spanish Inquisition. Um, but actually, it, it, the Spanish Inquisition has been brought forward. Uh, it's a Monty Python skit. For, for those under 30. Um, the Spanish Inquisition is often presented as proof of what happens when Christians have too much power. And you will frequently hear that the Spanish Inquisition uh, slaughtered hundreds of thousands of people in the name of sort of pure doctrine. Uh, there's a well-known journalist in Australia who's quite a critic of Christianity who once wrote an article where she mentioned the millions of secular martyrs killed by the Spanish Inquisition. But we now have all of the data because the inquisitors were disturbingly very good accountants. And the best research on this question has found that at a, as a maximum, the Spanish Inquisition was responsible for about 6,000 executions over 350 years. Now, don't mishear me. This is 6,000 too many. One death for believing false doctrine is, to my mind, a blasphemy against Christianity. But my point is, how did the death of 6,000 people over a 350-year period become emblematic of all that is wrong with religion. When if you just compare it with what the secular courts of the time were doing, this would not even be raised. It would not register a blip on the historical radar. And that's even before we compare, say, the Spanish Inquisition with an entirely secular movement, like the French Revolution. The French Revolution, just in nine months of the great terror of 1793-94, executed 17,000 people in the name of secular liberty, equality, fraternity. And yet no one is walking around today wagging their head at the French. I mean, some people do about the French, but for other reasons. No, and no one's going, oh... Oh, secular liberalism, it's the cause of all the problems in the world. No, but think of this. 
In just nine months, the French Revolution executed three times as many people as the entire 350-year Spanish Inquisition. Don't misunderstand me, though. I, I'm not having a competition. This is not, you know, theology by mathematics. Whoever killed fewest wins. I have a far more simple point. The problem isn't religion or irreligion, but the human heart with a passion unrestrained. Yes, the Inquisitions can kill people. Yes, secular liberty can be the cause of killing people. But the real problem is the human heart. The real problem is that we all have a log in our eye. So I'm suggesting a responsible approach to the bad behavior of Christians through history is first for Christians to concede the problem, not defend everything, just admit we have a log in the eye. And then for all of us, whether we're believers or we're not, to beware of the exaggerations that have slipped into our culture in a really profound way. But I have a third thing I want to say, and here's where I'll, I'll end. Don't get too excited. The third point's quite long. We need, to, we need to discern what is the unique contribution of Christianity to world history. Uh, I put it maybe like this. The, the real question isn't, have Christians participated in the evils common to humanity? The answer to that is, you bet, yes. But that isn't a very interesting question. I, I mean, you might as well just ask, are Christians human beings? Here's, here's the revealing question. Th that should occupy our minds whether we believe or not. What is Christianity's unique contribution to humanity? What is the odd thing Christianity brought? Because no one could claim that Christianity uniquely brought violence, warfare, torture, bigotry. I mean, the Romans and the Greeks were doing just fine on all those fronts without the Christians coming along. Slavery, hatred. It's everywhere in every culture. These are not unique contributions of Christianity. What is? What's the weird thing that marked Christianity out in antiquity and even today? Well, it's a question I got to put to one of the leading experts of antiquity. Professor Theresa Morgan, professor of Greek and Roman history at Oxford University for many years, though she has just moved to Yale. So how about that? And she is the author of this uh, really important, every scholar of antiquity thinks this is the book to read about what was morality outside of Christianity in the Greek and Roman world. So we got to ask her, what is the unique contribution of Christianity to that ancient context? I think that insistence by Christianity that God is always loving and always trustworthy and always just. And because of that, Christians are called always to practice those same goods towards God and always to practice those same goods to one another. That is a very big change in thinking from the ethics of the Greek and Roman world where the gods may be just but may not, where the gods may love human beings but may not, where being merciful, you know, might be the right thing on a certain day but might not, where loving your neighbour, you know, might serve you but might not. 
is a Christian insistence that if those things are good, they are good for everybody and they are always good. I think that was transformational for the Roman world and then for the Christian world and is perhaps the single greatest contribution of Christianity to public life. Absolutizing the ethic of love. That's the unique contribution of Christianity to the world. Even love of enemies. Of course, uh, Professor Morgan is thinking about a passage uh, like um, Luke chapter 6. Um, love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who mistreat you. If someone slaps you on one cheek, turn to them the other also. Do to others as you would have them do to you. Be merciful, just as your Father is merciful. For Jesus, love even of the enemy was the core. And not in some arbitrary ethical way either. It's actually the core to his own story arc. His gospel, his life, has this incredible arc of Yes, teaching about love, yes, loving, but in the end, on the cross, giving his life in love for the enemy. So, for Christians, at least in theory, love is not just an arbitrary command in a vacuum. It is, it is the very life of Jesus. And this had a massive influence on world history that is often overlooked because we now swim in the ocean of Christian ethics. Even if you're here as a skeptic, guaranteed your ethical outlook uh, has been influenced by this ethic. Um, the first international aid project we know in world history was the one conducted by Christians in the 40s AD during a terrible famine. The very first city-wide food programs available to any race or class or religion conducted by the church. We know, in fact, that 1,500 people were on this very early food roster list. And although it is, uh, of course, incredibly um, controversial uh, to even mention um, slavery, Christians have made terrible mistakes here. Christians have participated in and defended this ubiquitous evil. But what is less well known is that the only examples of opposition, principled opposition to slavery in history were ones led by Christians. And I'm not even talking Fred, uh, Frederick Douglass or William Wilberforce. I, I'm talking about St. Augustine in the fifth century from a letter only discovered in 1986. We know that Augustine's churches in North Africa had a regular practice of going down to the port of Hippo, busting out slaves in the slave ships before they'd be taken across the Mediterranean, housing them, feeding them, clothing them, and then sending them back home. How's that for a church activity? <laughs> Hardly anyone knows about Bishop Eligius, who eradicated slavery in northern France in the 600s. He used his own considerable wealth to purchase and free all slaves, no matter what race or religion, and gave them a stipend to go back home and demanded that all of his converts do the same. Yes, Christians have not done enough but here's one of their unique contributions. Or uh, my students in the Best and Worst of Christian History course get too much on this particular topic. The first public hospitals that we know of 
in all of history were the ones started by Basil of Caesarea in the uh, mid to late 300s and Fabiola of Rome at the end of the 300s. Within two or 300 years of, of this contribution, uh, there were literally hundreds of hospitals around Europe. And it's no accident that the oldest continually operating hospital in the world, the Hotel Dieu in Paris, uh, Hostel of God, was, uh, it's now a very secular hospital, but it was started in about 800 uh, by Christians. I could go on and on and on, and that would, that would get boring. Let me try and bring this to some kind of conclusion. Dismissing Christianity because of the bad behavior of the church is a little bit like dismissing Johann Sebastian Bach after hearing a terrible performance of, say, the cello suites. Do you know the beautiful prelude to the cello suites? It goes like this. Musicologists often say, this is one of the most mathematically sublime pieces of music ever composed. But imagine if I played it. Like, I'm pretty good on the guitar, but I can't play the cello. This is Bach's Cello Suites, one of the most beautiful, mathematically sublime pieces ever composed. But imagine if I played it. I've listened to the Cello Suites for years, but I'd never picked up a cello until last week. To judge a piece fairly, we know to distinguish between the masterpiece that was written and the pretty ordinary performance. to distinguish between the composition and the performance. Uh, Jesus wrote a beautiful tune. Love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Uh, a theme he took all the way to his own cross. It is true that Christians have not played in tune beautifully throughout history. And for that, we are sorry. But the tune has transformed our world. And it is true that Christians have played the melody with gusto at different times in history and made our world a better place. So let's distinguish between the beautiful composition, the sometimes ordinary performance. And I just hope tonight uh, some of us, particularly those for whom, you know, Christianity is in the balance, would hear the beautiful tune once again. Thank you.